showcasing uh, inequities and testing sites. Uh, Scott, one of the highlights of this period has been getting to know you a little bit and working with you on the Racial Equity Rapid Response Team Data Work Group. Um, so uh, I'm thrilled to, um, to be part of this panel today. Okay. So for me, it really comes down to this, right? Your zip code shouldn't predict how long you live, but it does. And that happens in Chicago, it happens in San Francisco, it happens in Dallas, it happens uh, across the United States and in other countries as well. This is not a US uh, specific problem. Your zip code shouldn't predict how long you live, but it does. There's nothing magical about zip codes, of course. Uh, Ewan Haig, who's on this call, has warned us about geographic determinism. And it really isn't anything about the zip code itself or the census tract or the census block, right? What we're seeing are in these place effects are, are the, the culmination, right, of structural and social policies that, that influence social life. Increasingly in health research, we talk about the causes of the causes, right? So our healthcare system is geared towards addressing downstream issues, mortality, whether it's life expectancy, infant mortality, or COVID. Uh, a lot of health promotion and public health has focused on risk behaviors and, 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 and health education and health literacy. But in the past 20, 25 years, it's been this huge momentum, um, a social movement really, right? I identifying, naming and confronting living conditions from this physical environment, the social environment in our communities, the institutional inequities that shape those living conditions and the far upstream systems of oppression, social inequities and systems of oppression that act as the fuel, right? For all of this um, distribution of, of, of resources. For me, the, the underlying concept in all of this, and if I only have 10 minutes with you, the one idea that I would present is the idea of structural violence, right? Uh, Paul Farmer has been the most eloquent writer in this area, but the idea itself is far older, uh, rooted in the 1960s writing of Johann Galtung. It refers to social arrangements that put individuals and populations in harm's way. The arrangements are structural because they are embedded in the political and economic organization of our social world, and they are violent because they cause injury to people. And that violence manifests, right, in unequal uh, life expectancy, unequal infant mortality, unequal COVID deaths. One of the projects that, that I've worked on in the past few years, and, and, and maybe uh, Raj will mention this as well in his remarks, is this book that we, we published last year called Community Health Equity, Chicago Reader, where we took on a really ambitious task of trying to synthesize a hugely complex literature in the medical, public health, social science, and popular um, realms into one book, right? That roughly told the story of how health equity work has, has changed in our city. In the end, we divided the book into five parts. A divided city looking at our deep-rooted segregation and inequality, the health gap, how this manifests in unequal life chances, separate and unequal care, looking at discrimination and inequality within the healthcare system itself, Part four was communities matter, how community level social determinants of health influence health patterns. And the fifth section, which was by far the most difficult per section to put together was taking action, right? We have a wealth of literature describing problems, relatively um, less material to work with in terms of actions um, uh, and solutions. I know there are lots of geographers on the call today, so I'm gonna show you some maps and I hope you'll appreciate them. The one on the left is one of my favorites, 1901, the American Journal of Sociology published this map, looking at, uh, in a very rough way, right? A hand-drawn shading of concentrations of child mortality, overcrowding, foreign population, lack of sanitation, criminality, ignorance, and economic distress. I've always thought that was a great map. No one plots ignorance anymore, but I think it's something that we should try to do perhaps. And of course, we're still interested in all of these other things, economic distress and child mortality and, and, and all of it. By the 1930s, we had better maps. We had the, the community areas formally designated. We had better maps uh, and mental health in particular from the 1930s. And there's a huge literature plotting the distribution of, 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 of unnecessary morbidity and premature mortality in our city. There's a huge history of activism uh, in Chicago and in other cities that I think uh, we should recognize if we're going to talk about health equity. One of the golden pieces in, in, in the book is this letter from Quentin Young on behalf of the Medical Committee for Human Rights, calling out segregation and discrimination in our hospital system. The letter itself was rooted in an earlier document from the 1950s called What Color Are Your Germs, written by, again, by a committee of doctors who were calling out segregation in our hospital systems. 
In the book, we also included material from the Black Panthers who ran sickle cell uh, screening and treatment programs in the 1960s and community health programs uh, in North Lawndale. Health equity work is a history of ongoing struggle, including this notable protest just a few years ago, um, um, galvanized around the death of Damien Turner, a young man who died um, in the South Side en route to Northwestern. Um, this protest was one of several, one of many that were calling for the University of Chicago to reopen an adult trauma center in the South Side. And in health equity work, we also have a legacy, a history of contrasting narratives, right, where we blame poor people, where we blame communities for their suffering. This was a well-intentioned but hugely problematic public health campaign, a black baby beside I am an outbreak. And you can imagine the anger, the anguish of a community member having to go get a, a, scan of, a can of spray paint to write beautiful on top of, of, of the, the advertisement. Again, so health equity is full of conflicting narratives and we have a, a dire history of, of blaming and pathologizing communities for their suffering. This for me is the fundamental problem, right? We have maps like this and it could be infant mortality, it could be diabetes, it could be asthma. They all kind of look the same. This is the problem, right? Every community has experienced amazing improvements over time, right? And this is looking at infant mortality and dramatic improvements since the 1930s. But the problem is the inequity between areas, right? The map is not even close to being uniform and being fair and being just. The fundamental problem is that even if we have overall progress, relative inequities persist um, and are deeply entrenched in our communities. And we see this with our newer data on COVID. A few more data points and then um, I'll pass the, the mic on to Scott for his presentation. These are some data from a, a new book that I've been working on uh, with Maureen Benjamin and fantastic colleagues at the Sinai Urban Health Institute to kind of help us situate Chicago in a larger context. So this is uh, all cause age adjusted mortality rates per 100,000 across the United States. 762 people will die per 100,000 every year. We have remarkable variants across the 30 largest cities. Chicago is kind of pretty close to the national average. We're at 768, far higher than the best off cities of San Francisco and San Jose and New York, but relatively better off than Baltimore, Detroit and Memphis. Las Vegas is an outlier. We, we triple check that number and it really is that. But the story becomes more interesting and more complex and more valuable when we look at inequities within these mortality rates. So we could look at rate ratios right, between black and white residents. Across the United States, the black-white rate ratio is 1.23. Black Americans die at a rate of 1.23 times the white Americans. Here again, we have dramatic differences between cities, pointing at the importance of local politics and local context for understanding health inequity. Here, Chicago is one of the worst off cities, not as bad off as Washington DC where the rate ratio is 2.2, ours is 1.58. But given this relative gap, and the size of our uh, black population, we have by far the highest number of annual excess black deaths in the United States at over 3,500. Black, black Chicagoans who die every year because the black rate is higher than the white rate. We've known this for a long time and the pattern is beginning to echo, right, with COVID. The very first results were in, in Chicago, 75% of our of deaths were from COVID were black. As you know, the mayor, uh, stood up a racial equity rapid response, emphasizing on these numbers, take your breath away. COVID-19 is hitting Chicago's black neighborhoods much harder than others. And she says that this is unacceptable. No one should think that this is okay. We're of course over the worst of the problem. Death rates, death uh, totals are far lower now than they were at the surge at the peak in May and early parts of June, but great damage has been done. And great damage has been done mirroring the long-standing structural drivers that produce the infant mortality and other kinds of maps. Very quickly to finish up, in zip code 60623, we've witnessed 156 deaths or 1,551 residents. In zip code 60610, we've witnessed 10 deaths. And I don't mean to minimize those 10 deaths, those are 10, 10 deaths, but that's one in almost 4,000 residents, an order of magnitude different difference than in 60623. So for me, all of this reflects structural violence, right? The, the social and political arrangements that harm populations and we're witnessing that um, in real time. 
Okay, there's lots more that I could and want to say, but I'm gonna be mindful of time because I wanna hear some of the great work of our colleagues. Um, so Scott, I'll turn it back to you. Great, thank you sure. for that summary. And uh, we could at this point um, quickly take a question if um, we have one in the chat box. Uh, I don't see one there. Um, but if um, anyone wants to unmute themselves at the moment, as I uh, load up my screen, it's kind of first come, first serve. <laughs> you know, Fernando, this is Joe Sweeterman. Um, that intriguing, some of your results mirror some things Scott's doing. What do you think it is about the far west side that seems to be uniquely high, you know, the Austin neighborhood, whatever, seems worse than even the, the far south side. Any theory on that? Yeah, that's a great question, Scott, or uh, Joe. Um, and I wonder, it, it really brings to light the importance of hyper-local data that we need to understand what's happening at the relatively large levels of communities and zip codes. But I think to really understand your, your question, we really need to look at, at smaller levels of geography as well, recognizing the differences that exist within the community areas. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I think, I think when, we, when we do that, we'll see that maybe some of the, um, some of the patterns are, are messier than we might see, and the west and south sides um, um, have similar pockets, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Thanks. Okay, let's go ahead and move on um, to the uh, the next subject, which is really, I'm going to start to look at uh, COVID-19 by the numbers, looking at it in terms of race, ethnicity, and, um, and income, and then kind of pivot to the role and the distribution of COVID-19 testing facilities on uh, COVID-19 out health outcomes across the city. And this figure here is showing, I think uh, Fernando was showing aggregate numbers of deaths by race ethnicity. This is daily death rates by race ethnicity um, since you know mid-March through September um, just la last week. And you can see there uh, that the early on you had huge spikes in terms of uh, COVID death rates among black residents. And um, between March 17 and May 9, the uh, black residents experienced the highest average daily death rates. And this was, it was great that the, these data were available, um, that city was able to identify these. I think that's step one in order to start identifying these disparities in order to then um, uh, develop strategies to address them. Um, and then you had uh, between May 9th and May 27th, uh, the Latinx population experiencing very high average uh, daily death rates. And um, just looking at it from a cumulative perspective, cumulative cases, tests, deaths, and the number of positive cases divided by the total number of tests, the positivity rate, um, there's a lot of disparity there. You have, uh, I think, in this by September 24th, there are 2,900 deaths or so. Um, 1,256 of them, uh, or 42.4 percent, are African American. That's uh, despite the fact that they represent um, 23 percent of the population. And then you see for the Latinx population, also uh, representing 33.1 percent of the deaths. Um, uh, which is larger than their proportional population across the city. Um, wanted to understand though, within the neighborhood level, how do COVID-19 testing facilities and the access to them, um, you know, uh, explain some of these variations in COVID-19 outcomes? So some of the questions we're asking in this research is, first of all, just what's the distribution of the testing facilities themselves? Uh, how does geographic access to these facilities vary across the city by neighborhood? And to what extent do, does this access to facilities explain variations in COVID outcomes in terms of mortality rates, case rates, and, and positivity rates? 
So first of all, you need we needed to better understand just the distribution of the uh, testing facilities. Maybe you're familiar with this. Maybe some of the people on the call have actually been tested. Um, there are lots of different sources. We, there's no single source of um, data set, I could say, that um, provides a comprehensive uh, list of these facilities. Uh, what we drew from was the Illinois De Department of Public Health, uh, the Chicago Department of Public Health, and also the electronic uh, lab reporting system, uh, which is probably the most comprehensive uh, but they do vary in terms of the type of information they offer. Uh, you know, some provide, provide a lot of information about eligibility, uh, scheduled hours of operation, and the languages offered there, which are all important in terms of access. It's not just about getting there or the distance. It's about whether or not um, you have access to testing at that, at that facility. Um, so, you know, the point here is that there's a, there's a lot of variation there. We combined these three data sets to, to put together a, um, uh, a single data set, kind of a uh, process of synchronization um, in order to get a, a representation of uh, COVID-19 facilities across, across the city. So and this is kind of what it looks like. You can see all the dots there. Um, we estimate about, uh, based on uh, our process, about 400 or so testing facilities, which sounds like a lot, um, but some of them I have fewer tests than others. Um, and, uh, you know, it, but you can see there are some areas that where there are clusters, especially in the northern area of the city uh, compared to the south. Um, we looked at measures of accessibility um, from census tract areas. There are about 795 census tracts throughout the city. So we estimated for each of these census tract origins you know, what is the relative access to these COVID testing sites? Um, we looked at it in, in measuring access is also there for all the geographers on the line know that there are a lot of different ways to operationalize or measure access. You could look at it just like the, the nearest facility in terms of distance. You could look at it maybe as an average to um, either the closest three facilities, or you could look at it in, in terms of travel time. and. Um, Given that Chicago residents rely a lot on public transportation, in fact, a fair number, a high percentage of the um, households actually don't have uh, access to a vehicle, um, it's important to measure access not only in terms of personal car, but by public transit. So we looked at it also in terms of public transit mode and walking and, and uh, personal vehicle. So uh, these are, this map, in addition to showing the distribution of uh, testing facilities, you're seeing uh, 20 minute isochrones or the distance you can get from the single origin located kind of in the center of that blue area um, by different modes of transportation. So this is the, you can see in the blue is just by walking, the green is by public transportation, and then yellow is a 20 minute within a 20 minute drive time with a personal car. So depending on your mobility, you have differential access to testing, right? Um, so we use those measures of accessibility to identify, uh, again, these variations uh, of um, relative access to COVID-19 testing facilities across the city. And the areas in red are those within the lowest quintile, those that have the least access to um, testing sites. And uh, when you start to look at, well, how does that compare, kind of these, you could maybe even refer to them as testing deserts, how do they compare to where testing is needed, like vulnerability um, to COVID-19 disruption? So we put together this index of vulnerability based on six component factors of, uh, you know, income in terms of poverty level and uh, the percent of essential workers, the percent of households without access to the internet, percent of households with no vehicles available, and also age and access to um, health insurance. Uh, so the areas in red here are those that have the highest COVID-19 vulnerability compared to areas in darkest blue, which would have the in the lowest quintile. So, and uh, actually I wanted to go to this one next. Oh no, I'll go here. So we looked at this um, in terms of vulnerability, but also in terms of COVID-19 outcomes 
And these are the cum maps of relative uh, cumulative death rates by zip code across um, the city. There are about 60 zip codes and um, we use the data from the Chicago uh, uh, city of Chicago to uh, that provide these updates on a weekly basis, but we use just cumulative numbers um, in terms of death rate, case rate, and positivity rates. And you can see those patterns that um, Fernando was showing, you know, back in the 30s and and, and earlier. Uh, some of them still exist today. These. Um, especially in terms of the, the west and south sides experience some of the disproportionate um, downsides of uh, this more recent disease. Um, but when we look at it in terms of, say, uh, testing and access to testing and um, also COVID outcomes by vulnerability, those highest vulnerability areas, you see that the death rate is much higher there, 150.9 versus 44.2 in those darkest blue areas. Um, also look at it in terms of positivity rate, which is almost double in those highest vulnerability areas. But the access to testing is also much lower in those areas. The mean time to nearest three testing sites, for example, is about seven minutes versus 4.2 minutes in the lowest vulnerability areas. So you see that not only do you have a lot of vulnerability or need for testing, but in some sense you have a uh, lack or a scarcity of testing facilities. We looked at this um, in uh, using multivariate regression models in order to control for very uh, several variables. In fact, we started with over 80 uh, potential um, predictor variables, um, in, including race, ethnicity, um, percent of essential workers, and travel times, and then, it is, and then including these accessibility measures. Let's see how I'm doing on time here. Okay, uh, this is about my last slide almost. So, um, the, uh, and essentially, we found that, first of all, these models do a fairly good job, even with limited number of variables, in explaining variations in these COVID outcomes, including cumulative death rate, which is that model at the top. For example, percent who are traveling uh, by or commuting to work by public transit on average in the, um, according to the American Community Survey, uh, that's positively related. And it's actually, actually that most um, powerful uh, predictor of uh, and positively um, correlated with cumulative death rate. Whereas, uh, you know, number of testing sites with, within a 30 minute trip and number of large testing sites or those sites that have 500 or more tests are negatively correlated. So the greater, um, uh, as you have less access to testing sites, you have greater um, cumulative death rates. Um, and that was true, um, also for cumulative case rates, in fact, the minimum average travel time to three testing sites is positively correlated with cumulative case rates. So as your time, travel time goes up to testing facilities, so does your case rate. Um, we also found that, um, in fact, this is the, the most powerful model uh, overall, explaining about 74% of, or 70% of the variation in positivity rate. Um, you know, percent people of color and percent limited English speaking households actually were very po powerful predictors here with also accessibility measures having some predictive capacity. So what does this mean overall moving forward? Um, essentially that there's need to improve coherence between the supply and demand for COVID testing within the city of Chicago. And I think Dr. Shaw is going to get into some of these um, supply and demand in, in the sense of uh, uh, and responding to demand. Um, I know the city has mobile sites that they um, uh, change locations on a weekly basis depending on where outbreaks are occurring. Um, but we need to find, you know, identify these kind of capacity constraints um, and identify solutions. You know, where can we um, provide a greater, you know, greater capacity in areas of great, greatest need, especially for those areas that are experiencing greater severity of symptoms. So, um, and I think we're going to get to this and Amanda will speak to some of this, but some of these strategies, how do we improve the reach, access, uptake, and impact 
of testing infrastructure, especially in high risk neighborhoods in order to improve these public health outcomes. But I'll leave it there for now um, on my end before we go to Dr. Shaw though, if you, there is a question, um, see if I- Yes, yeah. uh, so I can kind of, um, I was looking at the questions in the chat box. So mm -hmm. seeing some of the orders of those questions, but maybe the first question was uh, from uh, Joe Riley. I mean, if you want to ask the question or I can state it and you can, um, you know, uh, ask in more details, but is there any correlation between the instances of low density and African-American or Latinx communities in terms of being able to get care or tested? Uh, was it pop population density or I wasn't sure. Um, what, what density you're referring to? Yeah, the, the population density, because sometimes when, you know, there's not enough people in an area, you start yes. to see uh, just a collapse of everything, whether it be schools, housing, there just isn't enough there. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question, because obviously, you know, you're just going to have less resources generally in, in areas where you have less, you know, demand or, or need or population. Um, that was population density was one of our uh, predictors that we included in the, in the broader model. And a lot of these um, uh, variables are, you know, uh, ha, you know, are correlated with one another. So it didn't have the strongest predictive power um, compared to uh, the, the final six that we included. Um, but it was, um, you know, honestly, I have to look to see how, how it fared, because I know there's a lot of talk about population density. We did control for it, though, in, in our models. Okay, great. And I think uh, uh, Sh Shalidia and uh, Danny, the questions you're raising about how this might impact vaccines and, um, uh, you know, eventually the clinical, the current clinical trials and uh, uh, and eventually the distribution of a vaccine uh, is a good one, and I'll try to address it um, in some of my comments. And Danny, your questions also about supplies and their impact on accessibility, I'll try to raise in some of my uh, anecdotal examples of what was happening uh, from the ground um, as we were uh, trying to connect uh, during the surge. Um, and then I think uh, Linda, uh, Ray, Murray, uh, we'll come back to your question near the end as we have more time uh, for the evaluation around uh, increasing testing sites that would have had a positive impact um, and then how that might play out. So we're trying to just appreciate everybody putting in their questions and we'll try to get to them. And if we don't, please ask them again. We'll make sure we try to address them. Um, but are, are you okay, uh, Scott, with me um, going forward with some yeah, comments? Yeah, great. In, uh, okay. in respect of time, I think we should move ahead. Um, but yeah, there'll be hopefully more time at the end for um, questions uh, to, to all the panelists. Yeah, thanks. All right, wonderful. Well, thanks again, Scott. I echo Fernando um, in um, uh, you know inviting and co-creating this uh, lunch and learn capability uh, with the work from the Chaddock Institute and the Center for Community Health Equity. Um, and just a little bit of background about me is I trained in family medicine uh, as my primary appointment and then geriatrics. Uh, and I've been at Rush now for over 20 years, um, mainly in the space of working with older adults and finding new interventions uh, and running clinical trials to support conditions such as Alzheimer's disease, um, uh, but also been involved for the last six years uh, in advancing some of our capabilities around the city uh, for health equity issues. And we see these partnerships as excellent ways of sharing and growing and developing based on the knowledge that and expertise of all of us from our different viewpoints. So what I thought I would at least provide as we get ready from looking at sort of the patterns in the past, the data that uh, Scott presented about findings around um, analyses of what was happening with the COVID surge and afterwards uh, is to just give some anecdotes so that people will understand what it was like uh, as we were approaching um, uh, solving some of these problems on the fly, even if we were imperfect at it. Um, so I wanted to give two examples. So the first example was the coordination and work in an area that I uh, trained in and actually did some work, uh, which is the care in long-term uh, care settings. Um, 
Uh, and uh, right after I finished my um, fellowship, it was one of the first uh, activities I had was being a medical director in a nursing home in Berwyn, uh, where we brought students and to help with frail elderly patients. And I will tell you, this is the worst nightmare for anybody who works as a physician who is a medical director in a long-term care when you get an outbreak. We used to worry about flu epidemics that would go through a nursing home. And when the first um, stories came out of uh, Seattle at that time of the impact on a nursing home, uh, and it was actually a skilled nursing facility for people that were rehabilitating, um, and uh, as being one of the first clusters that were examined, uh, you know, it already started raising red flags in my mind, even though I hadn't practiced in that environment for a while, about the potential impact that was going to happen in long-term care settings. And we were starting to raise the signals in our health system, especially the fragmented, you know, public health, health system um, that we have currently in the United States and, and including Chicago, um, that, you know, one of the hardest hit groups would be uh, frail elderly individuals as far as increased risk of death in uh, congregate settings. Um, and uh, it was really early on uh, in the announcement, uh, somewhere in March, right after the same day that Governor Pritzker started making announcements about shelter in place, uh, there was a call that night before, it was a Sunday that I think he gave that order, the night before there was a call uh, to, uh, from the IDPH to volunteer physicians at Rush uh, to be able to go out on Sunday uh, to a nursing home facility in Willowbrook where they had had a case of a person that developed COVID. Um, and this was really early in the days of us even understanding what was happening, what was needed around um, sort of protection. Uh, but we had, you know, uh, 12 uh, staff members, volunteer, including family physicians, uh, nurse practitioners, nurses, uh, that took a bus from Rush downtown, you know, to Willowbrook on a Sunday morning. Uh, and I was coming in from the suburbs, so I drove there. And about 1 o'clock, you know, we were all kind of getting ready. We were a little bit late to meet up with some of the IDPH staff um, that were assigned to look out at the cluster and the outbreak. Um, and we were learning that same morning, and within 10 or 15 minutes, how to don personal protective equipment to keep ourselves safe with no knowledge of how things were being transmitted, um, uh, making sure that you know, we had the supplies that the IDPH provided to do some of the early sampling and collection in over 200 residents in that facility um, or across three floors, and then um, also the staff that was working uh, in that space. And, and one thing I distinctly remember, it was like a really nice, like beautiful spring day and uh, the sun was out and I was in the parking lot waiting for the bus with the other people to come by. And I look across the street and at the entrance for the building where there's already been a case, all right, and that's why we're about to go in, uh, there was a paramedic that came through, an EMT, right, in, in their ambulance uh, to pick up somebody. And he was a young Asian man who, uh, you know, I, I watched him walk out of the vehicle uh, with no mask, no gloves, and just walk into the building, right? And I couldn't imagine in my head, like, like, look, you know, the disconnect between what I was about to go in with full protective equipment and what was just happening with that 20-year-old that just walked in the building without knowledge of what we were just about to do. Um, we did end up going through, learning on the fly, very professional IDPH staff as they were learning about how to manage this and how to handle this at the first uh, events of collecting samples, documenting the samples, getting room numbers so they could do some I ideas of what was in the uh, long-term health care facility. Um, and then we, um, we ended up collecting that samples. Within about three days, we started getting results back that about the 200 residents and, and about 100 staff, uh, there were 70 positive cases. Um, and it just told you about how fast the spread was happening. And over time, I think in that facility, as more news came out about what was happening in long-term care settings as a, a large place for mortality uh, in the state of Illinois, I, I think over 30 people died in that facility. Um, 
Uh, and it just showed to me, like one of the things in the map that I think would be good for Scott to consider is we also have to know where these places are that are at higher vulnerability, especially like long-term care settings, and have plans already available and already staffed and ready uh, to handle these things in the future, building on mechanisms like how would you handle an influenza outbreak and you know, the standard operating procedures, and now hopefully we have measures around COVID. And in the short amount of time, I want to give you the second example, which is working with the Chicago Department of Public Health that happened about two or three weeks afterwards. And here now what was happening is the city was starting to get reports, um, was starting to realize the disconnect between where they have services and capabilities from a public health system, especially uh, you know, decades of a public health system not getting the funding and support to handle the throughput, and how they were working with health systems that were also dealing with patients coming in uh, and a total restructuring of how they were trying to help people with COVID symptoms, but then also being available in the community. So it happened at a lot of the medical centers around the city, but in uh, a collaboration between University of Illinois at Chicago and Rush, and the Rush contact was uh, Liz Davis, who's a general internist, um, uh, and she coordinated with infectious disease specialists at um, uh, UIC. They built a team and a way of scheduling um, uh, physicians, uh, mainly in primary care, uh, and infectious disease along with uh, nurses um, and uh, fellows in infectious disease to be a, a stand-up, kind of like a, a ready team to go out to various sites, especially in homeless shelters um, or transient housing uh, and, um, and then the long-term care facilities. And I became part of some of that in uh, uh, team uh, and, and going through a few of the volunteer activities where we would be called the day before and say the CDPH is asking us to go to this site. Let's you know rapidly get a team out there and then you know set up in um, in the dining hall usually of what these facility you know places were uh, where we would you know put all our equipment and our PPE and get it ready and then test everybody that was a resident there. Uh, we were using the rapid screening at that time um, so we would get a signal. Um, and we would enter people's data in the app that the CDPH had collected for future contact tracing. Uh, but then it was, it was mind boggling that we would be collecting this information from people in kind of an assembly line, testing them, and then asking people to wait in the end where some of them, we, uh, one of the physicians would go afterwards and talk to them about the results of their study. And then working with uh, congregate housing uh, facilities about spacing out people that seemed to test positive on this in the space and separating from people that were negative and doing this all rapidly as you were going from one institution to another to learn from each example. Um, having maps and you know, even knowing where those congregate living places were for homeless individuals or for transient housing upfront would have probably helped us in better planning and coordination, uh, but we spent most of our time just kind of um, being on the ready and uh, just waiting for that call that would come from CDPH. Now, in the end, that was a model that was not sustainable after the surge completed, right? Because you were depending on volunteers that were now getting pulled into their regular practices. Um, and we left a gap again in those communities for the potential for an outbreak to again occur. Um, so it just tells us we need models that can sustain, right? And I think I'm gonna end there and give the rest of the time back to Amanda, I'm a little bit over. But I just wanted to at least share those two um, kind of scenarios to give that flavor of what it was like um, on the front lines. That's great. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Thank you about, uh, the, and I think that your um, insights about the potential interactions, I think we talked yesterday between urban planning, you know, where uh, people can live in terms of, you know, and how constraints and zoning and so on and public health outcomes, uh, especially for, you know, with the aging population and, and, and so on, um, and just uh, affordability of housing. I think there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of talk in that area right now. Um, and I think, Amanda, this is a great segue for you to talk about sustainability and design. It uh, fits right in. So 
Um, yeah, that was a, it was a perfect transition. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do you want to go ahead and you have some slides, right? I do. Um, I will pull them up. All right, are we set? Sure, it looks good. Thank you. So my name is Amanda Lee. I am a nurse practitioner by training and the director of practice transformation at Access Community Health Network. And like many of my co-presenters on this call have spent uh, the last months and months uh, very deep in COVID <laughs> planning and evaluating. And so I have been leading our large inter interdisciplinary team to uh, to design and implement and evaluate our COVID testing process at Access. And I do just want to say what an honor it is to be included in this group. And I think we know that there's strength in intersectional and interdisciplinary collaboration to address these complex challenges. And I think this shared space just really highlights that well. So thank you for, for inviting us all today. So in, in my presentation, I'll briefly review our response at Access and um, in, in looking in building a sustainable model and really looking to bring testing and care to communities that we know have been uh, historically um, experienced health disparities. So Access is, for, for those that are unfamiliar, very briefly, we're a large federally qualified health center network. So we have 35 health centers across Cook County and DuPage County. So we have a very wide um, geographic footprint and we care for about 180,000 patients annually and about 30% are African American, <clears throat> excuse me, 50% are Hispanic and around 90% are at or below the 200% of the federal poverty level. And so in our, our COVID testing principles, so we started this process mid-April and, <clears throat> excuse me, which is a, a little, you, you know, things were already happening at that point. And our top guiding principle in this whole process was really safety for our patients and staff. And we know there was a pretty significant PPE shortage at the beginning of the pandemic. So that really drove a lot of when we were able to, to integrate this into our practice. And we also know that testing is, of course, a crucial component to identify infections and reduce spread and always supporting our mission to make testing available to those in their own communities that they live in. And one of the things that we thought a lot about at the beginning is accessibility. So um, I think some had, someone earlier had talked about transportation and the, the reliance of public transportation in Chicago. And so we decided early on that we didn't wanna do drive up testing, even though that's a really successful model at a lot of places, but we didn't um, want that to be a limiting factor in, um, or access to a car to be a limiting factor in, in patient's ability to be tested. We also embedded our, our testing model within our medical home model. So we, we do primary care and um, decided to use telehealth as, as part of a critical part of the testing process. And so that means we're able to have an assessment um, both you know, for health, for health um, components and then for needs, just general needs um, and social determinants needs and um, provide education around COVID because we know it was, it's, and honestly still is, there's so much change and confusion. So being able to have that touch point of speaking with a healthcare provider and really covering all the information and the isolation criteria, and then also linkage to resources. So behavioral health, food resources, um, et cetera. And so we use the, the highest level of, uh, PPE recommendations by the by IDPH and CD, the CDC. And what I'm really going to talk about today, um, I think that I thought would be the most interesting for this group is, is our sustainable testing design. Uh, so, so very early on, we, we wanted to build sustainable testing that could adapt to weather and to, could adapt to different COVID testing processes because we knew early on that that could, could change. And also to be prepared for vaccination advancement. So um, that has been part of our planning from, from the very beginning. In, and so just, I'm gonna walk you through our site design just to get an idea kind of how we approach this. And, and so again, the goal was just the highest level of protection for patients and staff. We wanted a really streamlined traffic flow. And the goal is to have patients at our sites for under 10 minutes. Um, and often we've definitely been able to do that. Often it's under five, they can be in and out um, with the testing process. And so what we did is we utilized five sites that we already owned. And so two, two are converted health centers 
centers that are in areas, again, on the south and west side that were in areas of the highest need or the, the biggest desert. And one, for example, was in an area where we had three health centers that were fairly close so that we knew from a patient care perspective by tr transitioning one to a testing site, we could still meet the patient care needs at the other two nearby health centers. And then we also had three um, spaces that were adjacent to our health centers that were transitional. So two, I believe, were going to be senior centers, and one is a, it was a pharmacy that was transitioning to something else. So we utilized those spaces that we already owned, and through a robust uh, process, we're able to convert them into testing sites. And so all five of these sites are, are still very operational, and we are, we're ready to, to enter the winter um, under the same operations that we've been doing. And I think a critical part really was the design team. So we had a contractor for the construction that needed to happen in these sites. We had our operations team, our, in, our IS um, and technology and EPIC teams, our, our lab team, infection control, and then our communications team to really think about how to visually move people through, how to do the community engagement, and all of those really, really important pieces. So looking at a couple of the staff uh, protection pieces, so um, of course, personal protective equipment, and then the, the innovation is really the, the installation of physical barriers, which look a little different in each space. Uh, but essentially at the check-in when patients arrive, there's a plexiglass barrier between the patients and the staff where only, where only materials are being handed from the staff to the patient. So they give them the lab requisition, they give them educational handouts, and then they proceed to the testing area immediately. In the specimen collection area, we've also installed um, stalls or you know whatever you call them, for lack of a better word, or stations, I guess. Um, and so a provider has an assigned area. There's a plexiglass window that they can open and close and, and collect the specimen in, which again just provides that additional barrier. The the areas are cleaned um, nightly. And I think the other big um, important thing for us is that they're used for COVID testing only. So there's no other care activities happening in these spaces. Um, I think I'm probably already out of time, but I'll very briefly walk you through these two sites. So this is our Melrose Park testing site, uh, which is um, west of the city and probably our highest volume site. Uh, and again, so just looking at the, the floor plan on the bottom left, really trying to make a streamlined process so there's no double backing. Um, it's very easy and clear to, to move through from registration to the testing area. And then our different care team members who are ready to, to, to serve the patients that day. And our San Rafael testing site is in the Little Village neighborhood. And this is an existing health center that was converted to a test site. So a couple of differences here, we installed the um, check-in area with barriers in our waiting room. And then the, the, the barriers, um, the exam rooms are used for testing, but we still install those additional barriers as well. Just, this is just a map of where our testing locations are. And then on the right is a heat map of where our positive cases have been. And so as of, as of this month, we've tested over 10,000 individuals and had about a, a little over 1,000 that have been diagnosed positive. So we've really, really been able to have pretty significant reach in terms of testing both our patients and, and community members. And that is my, that is my, the end. Right. Thank you, Amanda, for that. And uh, just amazing the amount of care that went into the healthcare and the design of these systems. I wasn't sure if um, you were drawing from other models or is this also, uh, you know, something that um, um, Access was putting forth, you know, innovating on, on the fly. Um, a combination, I'd say. So we, we worked with the University of Chicago very early on um, in the early weeks um, because they had successfully implemented some indoor testing facilities that we were really interested in. And so they had some, some general templates um, in terms of flow and staffing um, that we were, that, that, they sh that they shared with us. And then of course, when you're, you know, every organization works a little differently. So we had to figure out how to make it work within our systems. Um, so there was a very, like I said, a very large team of people working very hard, very fast um, to, to make these pieces fit together um, so that it could be a, a, a smooth process for, for both our patients and our staff. Great. I just inserted my question before everyone else is now we can open, up, open it up to others. Uh, let me see. Dr. Shaw, you had some... Uh some questions that were in the chat. I don't know, we go back to those. Um, oh, sure, yeah. So I think the one question I wanted to address, uh, which Amanda started talking about, which I was glad, was how do we prepare 
or use this knowledge to advance our capabilities uh, when a vaccine becomes available. Um, it also influences how we get the proof and the knowledge that the vaccines work. So right now the United States is uh, working through a partnership with vaccine developers and uh, the federal government, including the NIH, in a project called Operation Warp Speed uh, to be able to generate the data. And multiple institutions in Chicago are participating in those clinical research trials. Um, uh, one is already ongoing uh, that started uh, two months ago at UIC uh, with one of the initial products out of the five that were going to be tested. Uh, with that Operation Warp Speed, uh, another one has just started, um, uh, and a third one is about to start. Um, so um, it, it requires involvement. There's been a large commitment on the NIH and the vaccine developers uh, to try their best to ensure that the, the essential workers and uh, diverse uh, participants are included uh, into the results of the studies so then there can be better shared decision-making once that becomes available and that um, data can apply to all. I know it's going to be a challenge. I'm an investigator on the team at Rush uh, to do this type of studies uh, based on uh, just we don't have the natural access we used to, which is to be able to go to people's you know, churches and congregate areas and to have conversations with them. We're going to have to use different ways to get information out. Um, and I think that's the biggest lesson in my mind about what's going to happen, not only for the trial, but then also for vaccine delivery, which they're also prioritizing, like they have been for the flu, for certain populations, including those that are um, uh, 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 usually um, uh, of uh, uh, diverse communities and uh, lower socioeconomic status. Um, and we just have to be prepared for this. Um, and the problem is in this entire story is this information asymmetry, right? Like the structural barrier in my mind is, is that there's some groups that get better information to act on uh, than others. Uh, and presentations like this is how do we try to break through those barriers without us having to tell the same story 100 years from now when the 50th pandemic will occur, all right? Um, and it just requires us to keep an open mind and to listen to all of us from different perspectives uh, to, to give people the best information so they can make decisions at their kitchen table about what makes sense for them around participation in a trial and hopefully getting vaccinated. If anything, we need everybody to get vaccinated for the flu. I'm just gonna be honest and put that plug in right now um, because that is something we can do. Right? That's, it's not theoretical, it's something that we can do. And um, so I'll stop there, but I, I, I think that's a big part of it. The seeing patterns will exist um, as the, the questioner rightfully brought up. Yeah, are there any other, thank you for that elaboration, Raj. Um, are there any other questions? Um, we could try just opening the mic at this point. We have a couple minutes left. If it's complete mayhem, we can raise hands, but, oh, there's one in the chat. Hi, <clears throat> Alan. Hi, Scott. Hey, Alan. I, you know, one of the things, and you have the experts there, I'm 75 years old, and I'm really concerned about when I should consider getting the vaccine. I mean, I realize it won't be out till the beginning of next year that, uh, First responders are probably be first, but how do I determine if I feel comfortable getting this vaccine? Yeah, I think that's a good question, Alan, and it's a question that people uh, do need to ask. Um, and that's why I think we're trying so hard right now to follow the strictest guidelines on the scientific process and evaluation for safety and efficacy. And that's why you're seeing multiple vaccines being developed rather than just one. I will tell you, I've never seen anything like this in my life, okay, around vaccine development. Vaccines usually take about 20 years to develop. We're about to try to do this in a framework of two years. Um, it is unprecedented, right? Like, I, I hate to say that, everybody uses the word unprecedented, but really it's just, I, I mean, it's mind boggling. What do you think through the technologies that are getting us here, 
and the teams that are having to develop, and it just shows the innovation of all of us. Hopefully, we will have better answers to the type of questions about sort of, you know, the, the benefit, the harm, um, and uh, the risk associated with the benefit and the harm, so people can then make the best decisions. Uh, you know, we will be including a lot more older adults into these studies because we know immunization has different impacts uh, and, uh, and the immune system responds differently. Uh, but we just have to understand by getting diverse people into the studies that will generate the data um, and be those citizen scientists to join us. But it's it's a, a great question. And just yeah. as a follow-up, there are five major studies going on, I believe. How do you determine which one you should go? Is that just where your provider, whoever your provider is, if it's Northwestern or yes. clinic, whatever, whatever they have? Or do you think that you would feel more comfortable getting it from Moderna rather than Johnson and Johnson? Yeah, no, I, I think that's always a difficulty when there's multiple different types of vaccines going on and each one having different perspectives. Uh, but I, I, am, I'm, I want people to join in whatever they're comfortable, right? Because we, we need data on all of this. So even if you're a rush patient and you want to go into a study at UIC because it's closer to you or the scheduling is better, then do it, right? Like it, it is not a problem. We actually nationally, we've been working on building the COVID prevention network and there's a registry where people can sign up about their interests and know which are the sites that might qualify. And then they can have those talks and discussions about, you know, the, the way the study is structured and make a best decision for themselves. Thank you. All right. I think we're just a minute after our, our time. And I know that we, there are some unanswered questions, but we're going to have to end it there because I know you need to get into your next Zoom meeting somewhere. Um, the uh, thanks again, Fernando, Raj, Amanda, and all of the guests who tuned in today. And um, yeah, there was a question about the availability. It will be, the recording will be made available and we'll send out a link um, to that recording. So thanks again, everybody. And um, we hope to have some more good news um, responding to this, uh, these health disparities in the future as we think of them more critically. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Scott. Thanks, all. Have a good day. You too. See you later.